Well, welcome everyone. My name is Erin Ramos. I'm the Deputy Director of the Division of Genomic Medicine at NHGRI. We're incredibly grateful that all of you agreed to join us today to discuss such an important topic. Before I introduce our wonderful uh, planning committee and workshop co-chairs, I did want to mention that later this afternoon, President Biden will sign the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act, which is establishing June 19th as a federal holiday to commemorate the end of slavery in the U.S. Um, this means, uh, given that, that June 19th falls on a Saturday, this means that federal employees will observe the holiday tomorrow. This is uh, a very important and momentous um, uh, event in our history. We had planned to share some information regarding Juneteenth tomorrow uh, before we knew it would be a federal holiday. Um, so as far as the workshop plans for tomorrow go, we're still awaiting additional information from Office of Personnel Management, HHS, and the NIH, and we'll share updates you uh, with you later this afternoon. So I just wanted to put that on your, your radar screen, and we'll keep you posted and we'll uh, potentially solicit some additional information from you later today on how to proceed. So I, I wanted to just briefly introduce our, our co-chairs. So Dr. Howard Chang is the Virginia and DK Ludwig Professor of Cancer Research and a Professor of Genetics at Stanford University. He's also, uh, which we're grateful for, a, a current member of the NHGRI Advisory Council. Um, many of you know Howard, his group has made a series of discoveries that introduce the roles of long coding RNAs in biological regulation. Um, and as a physician scientist, his long-term goal is to decipher the regulatory information in the human genome for disease diagnosis and therapy. And Dr. Judy Cho is Dean of Translational Genetics and the director of the Charles Bronfman Institute for Personalized Medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, Judy has extensive experience in defining genetic factors underlying susceptibility to inflammatory bowel disease. She's a PI and chair of the steering committee of the NIDDK IBD Genetics Consortium and also a member of the NIDDK Advisory Council. So Howard and uh, Judy, thank you, and I'll turn it over to you. All right, welcome everybody. I wanna thank you all for taking time to participate in this important workshop. Uh, and uh, first, I just want to mention that uh, this is going to be a two-day workshop, and hope you will actually participate in both days, and we are looking for active participation uh, from all of you. Judy? Yeah, so beyond active participation, uh, we're also thinking of uh, writing a perspective piece. Um, this is a very tight schedule, so we want folks to, the moderators are encouraged to give the speakers the one-minute uh, verbal notice uh, to, that we need to one minute less for their for their talk. Perfect. Yeah, we uh, anticipate that at the end of this workshop, we'll, we can hopefully give NHGRI some concrete recommendations uh, for the future of this important area of research in multi-omics. Uh, and part of the, our summary of the state of the field could end up in a perspective piece uh, that can be published in an academic journal. All right. So. Uh, just some rules for the road. Can we go to slide four, please? Okay, great. So since this is a virtual workshop, uh, please on your Zoom profile, uh, write your name and affiliation. Uh, and uh, your videos and audio will be turned off by default uh, to reduce noise. Uh, but uh, when you uh, want to participate, please turn on your video, especially in during discussion sessions. Uh, to, 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 raise, uh, to let people know that you want to speak, you can use the raise hand feature during the Q&A, or you can post questions using the chat function, and we'll be looking out for that to basically call you out. And when you're called, please turn on your audio and video and speak, and by first by saying your name and affiliation. Uh, we're going to be recording everything so there can be a record uh, of all the comments. And finally, given the fact that the workshop has a limited number of participants, and it's just really a kind of, it's an on, we're discussing ongoing future work, uh, please no sharing on social media. All right. So uh, with that, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to kick off uh, the first session uh, to kind of set the stage for this workshop, to talk about the workshop rationale. Uh, and uh, as Judy mentioned, uh, every um, we're going to give a little uh, time warning. Uh, the moderator will be doing that, uh, be a verbal one minute warning. Uh, each participant, uh, will, a speaker, will have a 10 minute uh, presentation time and, uh, and the moderator will be keeping time. 
And now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, one of our hosts, uh, Dr. Eric Green. Uh, Eric uh, is the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute uh, at, at NIH, of course. Uh, prior to his appointment as director, he served as the Institute's scientific director, chief of the NHGRI Genome Technology Branch, and founding director of the uh, NIH Intramural Sequencing Center. Uh, and I believe that he'll be, uh, this session will be hearing about a lot about NIH, uh, NHGRI's vision, but also about the current portfolio and then potential uh, uh, areas uh, for, for the future. Eric, uh, the screen is yours. Hey, uh, thank you, Howard. Can everybody see me and see my slide? Yes? You yes. Slide? Great, yes. thank you. So thank you uh, for attending this NHGRI workshop. Uh, you will contribute to um, helping us understand an area that um, was uh, mentioned and discussed and has been incubated for a while, but specifically mentioned in our new strategic vision. And context is everything. And while many of you who are participating in this workshop are familiar with our strategic vision and probably even contributed to it directly through various events that led up to it, um, I thought it was important to provide the context to everybody participating. And so what I'm gonna just briefly tell you about is to set the context of sort of the history and the publication of our latest strategic vision, which really is, is just part of a history of the field, part of the history of the Institute, whereby strategic visions have been critically important first during the Human Genome Project, and then the two uh, strategic visions that the Institute published since the end of the, of the Human Genome Project that really have provided a blueprint or a roadmap, whatever metaphor you wanna use, for the kind of programmatic priorities that the Institute was gonna pursue. As an organization, I will tell you that these strategic visions absolutely define eras for the Institute, whether it's the Human Genome Project, the years that immediately followed the Human Genome Project, or in our last strategic vision, really setting us on a course in route to the implementation of genomic medicine. But as we entered the new decade, we recognized that it was important to basically update the strategic vision. The previous one was a decade old, and so we sought through a process that we referred to as Genomics 2020 to create a 2020 vision, if you will, uh, for the next decade of human genomics research. But we also did so recognizing that genomics has changed completely over the last 20 years or so, where once upon a time it was a very tight discipline, a relatively small community of researchers pursuing relatively narrow goals, such as those of the Human Genome Project, but of course now genomics is everywhere, widely disseminated across the biomedical research enterprise, certainly disseminated across all of NIH. And as a result, NHGRI can no longer be about all of genomics, but rather we really are much more about the forefront of genomics, which is our organizational mantra. And so through the two and a half years or so of strategic planning that we conducted, that yielded in October of last year, this 10 page paper in Nature, everything we talked about was trying to distill the most compelling things that we had to be cognizant about at the forefront of genomics. And I hope all of you have read this, or if you have not, please do read it. And I give you the URL for the website that has lots of materials about the strategic planning process and actually has the strategic vision document itself. At the end of the day, the community was incredibly helpful to us. Our advisory process and workshops and working groups all contributed tremendous numbers of good ideas. And at the end of the day, we had to sort of distill them down to some of the most compelling things that we wanted to describe in the strategic vision. And we found that they actually differed amongst the different types of ideas that bubbled up. And at the end, we, we found a four component or sort of four classifications that really nicely grouped all the elements of our strategic vision. One of the areas related to rearticulating and amplifying and building upon guiding values and principles that undergird the entire field of genomics. Another set of elements talked about maintaining, sustaining, and building upon and enhancing the many aspects of the foundation of genomics. And the foundation is so used not only um, by, by geneticists and genomicists, but increasingly by all biomedical researchers. Some of the elements talked about the barriers that currently exist to make genomics even more powerful. And what are the new barriers uh, like we faced at the end of the Genome Project, the cost of DNA sequencing? Well, that barrier has been knocked down. But what are the new barriers? And we describe in the strategic vision a number of barriers that we will now try to pursue to knock down and facilitate others from pursuing uh, genomic uh, research activities. 
And finally, of course, there's compelling research projects. There always are. And we articulate some of the most compelling ones among those. And all of these elements together really represent the most important activities at the forefront of genomics. When you read our strategic vision, you will also see we included something new that we've never included before. We came up with 10 bold, truly audacious predictions for the coming decade. Uh, these 10 really are unlikely to all come true, but even if a few of them came true by 2030, it would be truly remarkable. Compared to everything else that was written, it was amazing how much press attention that these 10 bold predictions um, really have uh, received. I was asked to write a commentary in Scientific American when the publication came out um, describing uh, these uh, bold predictions. And we actually got so much feedback about them that we've actually put together a seminar series and we're literally at halftime right now, 10 part series throughout 2021 uh, 20, uh, and 2022. And um, we've done five of these. We're doing one seminar session for each of the 10 bold predictions. Like I said, we've done the first five. Uh, the next one is July 12th, for example, and you can see the, uh, the rest of the schedule shown here. Now, it's really important to appreciate our strategic vision is about certain things and is not about other things. It is a broad vision for human genomics with an emphasis on health application. It is a reflection of the forefront of genomics, the things that NHGRI is gonna provide responsible stewardship and leadership and really keep articulating the vision for. And of course, we hope that this uh, document will illustrate and illuminate and inspire. At the same time, I want you to make sure you realize what it is not. It's not a vision for all of genomics. It's really genomics really related to human health and disease. It is not an NHGRI only vision. In fact, many pursuing genomics will help us achieve the vision we articulate here, including other funders around the world. It's also not just five years. We sort of view this more on a 10 year time scale. And finally, the 10 pages of nature don't describe how we're gonna implement it. It just describes the vision for it. And that's where this workshop comes in because the strategic planning process was all about collecting ideas and needs and proposals and possible obstacles and then distilling them down as I've described into the 10 pages that we published in nature. But now the real work begins in many ways because we're gonna take a subset of the elements we heard about and implement them. We're gonna implement them through projects, in some cases through programs, in some cases through new initiatives, or maybe some cases will require policies. We planted seeds in each of those four major areas within our strategic vision. And now a subset of those seeds, we're gonna more aggressively try to germinate. The purpose of this workshop, which other speakers who will follow me will describe, is to take one of the seeds where we talked about multi-omic opportunities in health and disease and try to see if it's time to germinate that seed. And if so, what might that look like? And that's the input we wanna get from this workshop to feed into some of the things that we might develop into a program. To give you a sense of what another seed might look like, I just want to highlight one seed. It's a very important one. It's one of the ones we decided to germinate very quickly. It came up twice in the strategic vision, once in the guiding principles and values where when we described among some of the most important principles and values, one of them was championing a diverse genomics workforce. And we talked about how the promise of genomics really could not be fully achieved if we weren't thinking about the diversity of the workforce involved in genomics and genomic medicine and all aspects of it broadly defined. We thought this was such an important concept and what we heard in strategic planning process was that we even had to consider this notion as part of the foundation for all of genomics. And so sure enough, when we were talking about sustaining and improving a robust foundation for genomics, this notion came up again, where we talked about fostering a diverse genomic workforce and even lay out in a little more detail how we're going to achieve that. We are very serious about our commitment to improving and enhancing this workforce. So literally, when the sun came up on 2021, this new year and New Year's, in fact, uh, we released a, what we call an action agenda uh, for enhancing the, the diversity of the genomics workforce. And hand in hand with this PDF document, which you can download from this website, Vince Bonham and I, who is now actually the acting deputy director for, for NHGRI, uh, took, took that position starting this past Monday, but for over a decade has been my senior advisor um, for, for genomics and health, and, and, and health disparities. He and I wrote this commentary, it was the very first article published in the American Journal of Human Genetics in 2021, that reiterates the key elements of this action agenda. I list the goals here and off we go, because now I can tell you we are aggressively pursuing new funding opportunities that will be able to act on the very agenda described um, in this PDF and that we outline in this commentary. 
This is a perfect example of taking a seed of an idea in our strategic vision and then germinating it into real programmatic action. It's not the only seed that's being germinated. That's just the one I happen to illustrate here. Here's a representative of others that either we started to germinate already or we're in the process of germinating at various stages. One minute. It gives you a great illustration of how we go from elements in a strategic vision to actually executing them. We're doing it in multiple different ways and we are asking you to help us study this element where we just talk about multiomics and health and disease and help us decide is the timing right to germinate it? And if so, what might that look like? And in doing so, I think it will help us take the elements of this 2020 strategic vision and have many of them bloom um, into something that will really be, make us proud 10 years uh, in the future when we look back and see how this strategic vision guided advances in human genomics throughout the 2020s. So I will stop there and um, turn this over to the other speakers. Um, and then there's going to be a Q&A session, I think, after several speakers. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions then. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Joanna, uh, Joanella Morales. Uh, Dr. Morales uh, joined the Division of Genomic uh, Medicine as a program director in January 2021. She's a project scientist for the Clinical Genome Resource, also known as ClinGen, a consortium that aims to define the clinical relevance of genes and variants for use in precision medicine and research. Dr. Morales is also focused on the development of initiatives related to multiomics of health and disease. And the title of her talk is Purpose of the Workshop and Agenda Overview. Uh, Dr. Morales, please take it away. Thank you very much. Can you, can everybody see my screen? Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this first day of the workshop. And my goal for the next few minutes or so is to provide a bit of context on the purpose of the workshop and our specific objectives. And then I'm going to briefly go over the agenda to give you a sense of what we will cover today and tomorrow. But before I get to that, I would like to first recognize the members of our workshop planning committee uh, for their guidance and support as we plan this workshop. You have already met our two co-chairs, Howard Chang and Judy Cho, and you will meet the rest of the members during the course of this event. Dave Bodine and Jonathan Haynes will help moderate some of the sessions, and Tuli Lapalainen and Tess Mersha will be speakers. I would also like to recognize my colleagues at the NHGRI for the many hours of hard work, Marie Brennan, Laurie Finley, Ajay Pillai, and Aaron Ramos. And last but not least, I would like to thank our colleagues in the communications and AV support teams who have given us a tremendous amount of support. So thank you, everyone. So how should we start? Uh, usually a good place to start is by defining the topic of interest. Advances in technology over the years have led to an increasing number of studies that focus on distinct types of cellular molecules. And all of these molecules represent layers of a complex biological system. Probably all of you are very familiar with all the terms listed here, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, epigenomics, metabolomics. The prefix makes very clear the type of molecule that's under analysis. But when we talk about multiomics, what do we actually mean? And for our purposes, multiomics is by nature a systems biology approach where the focus is not so much on the individual layers, but on the biological system as a whole. And the data sets of interest, therefore, are the multiple ohms or the layers. And the hope is that the integration of all those layers provide insights that do go beyond what each layer alone can provide. Now, the systems biology approach also implies that there's a comprehensive assessment of the actual biological system, be that an individual, a tissue, or a cell. And this does require the use of high throughput technologies, which in turn uh, does generate a vast amount of data or big data. And to properly interpret and make sense of this data, one does need interdisciplinary expertise. So as you can see, multiomics as a field is, is very complex. However, it holds a lot of promise. It can provide a more detailed molecular understanding of the biological process processes that are affected by disease, helping elucidate cause and effect relationships. And in recognition of this, the NIH has made significant investments in the field over the years. And as my colleague Marie will discuss in more detail shortly, if one does a simple review of funded grants 
or of the literature, it will be clear that multiomics technologies have been used for a number of purposes. For example, to define biomarkers of both the healthy and the disease state, to track and model disease progression, to develop drug targets and to define therapeutic interventions, to consider environmental influence and then to separate those out from the genetic components, and actually even to solve undiagnosed cases as a complement to whole genome and whole exome sequencing. However, that same review would also reveal that there are gaps and limitations. This is the case with respect to technology, both experimental and computational, with respect to data integration, especially when one considers how challenging multiomics is given the multidimensional and often longitudinal nature of, of, of these studies. There are also study design considerations, for example, the sample size, the source of data, um, the diversity of the samples, and whether or not harmonization standards are being followed. And then there are limitations with respect to the application into clinical, into clinical settings. So the hope and promise of multiomics was articulated in our 2020 strategic vision. It was highlighted as one of the compelling genomics research projects. And just to say a word about those, those are by nature ambitious, and they do aim to address questions that at the moment seem, seem out of reach. And as Dr. Green said, these are at the forefront of genomics. And a number of projects were flagged, and I'm showing box four in, in, that, in the strategic vision, and a number of projects were, were highlighted as being compelling, but where multiomics is concerned, one ambitious aim is to extend multiomic studies of human disease and health into clinical settings. The strategic vision then goes on to expand on areas of focus that can lead towards achieving this big goal. In the research arena, we want to extend genomics before, beyond DNA sequence to include other multiomics data and to combine those data with clinical variables and outcomes. This will require us to dig deeper into the tissue and cell level. It will likely require new tools and technologies. We will need to think of new approaches for data integration, and we will need to uphold values and principles that are articulated, for example, ensuring sample diversity. The focus of multiomics research will increase our understanding of biological processes and will help us get a better understanding of disease triggers, onset and progression. All of this will build into better strategies to both prevent and to treat, facil and to treat facilitating drug discovery efforts. In terms of clinical application, for successful adoption in the clinic, Multiomics data will need to be integrated with clinical decision support tools and with electronic health records. While this is a bit further down the road, it is important to start considering the steps that we might take in order to do this. The hope, of course, is that multiomics integration will facilitate transition from a view of medicine that is focusing on diagnosing and treating disease to one that is focused on maintaining health and wellness. As described earlier, the strategic vision is very much focused on defining what's at the forefront of genomics. So the question for us to consider as we participate in this workshop is, where is the forefront of genomics in the multiomics space? And our goal is that this two-day workshop will help us by getting feedback from all of you, um, will help us answer this question. Specifically for the workshop, our, ob our objectives are to gain insight in terms of how multiomics data can improve our understanding of health and disease, to identify study design, data integration, and technological gaps and challenges, to consider steps that will be required for future clinical application, and obviously to define opportunities, opportunities that are relevant to NHGRI's mission and therefore at the forefront of genomics. So hopefully that has provided some context on the rationale for this particular workshop. And now what I would like to do is just to briefly go over the agenda to give you a sense of what to expect um, today and tomorrow. So as you know, this workshop will span two days, two afternoons, and we have divided the workshop into five different sessions. The first session will help set the stage. These are our keynote presentations that will help us think through the state of the science at the moment. The second session will be focused on technology, data integration, and study designs. Study design. We'll have three presentations followed by a panel discussion. 
The third session will be focused on application of multiomics to observational studies. Again, four presentations followed by a panel discussion. The fourth session will help us think about the, the steps that are required for future clinical implementation. And the last session tomorrow afternoon, we'll look at recommendations to the NHGRI. I will leave um, a bit more detail about today just here for you to review. I won't go into detail since I know all of you have the agenda. Just to say that we will get through sessions one and two today, and I encourage you to come back tomorrow for the exciting conclusion of this workshop. And with that, I will say thank you so much for joining us. I will stop sharing my screen and pass it on to the next participant. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dr. Morales. Uh, that was very helpful to set the stage. And our uh, next speaker uh, is Dr. Marie-Louise Brennan. Uh, Dr. Brennan is a fellow of the uh, NIH ACMG Genomics Medicine Management Program. She received her research training at UCLA and clinical training at uh, Cleveland Clinic and Stanford University. Her research interests include multiomic technologies and clinical implementation. She will tell us about uh, a summary of NIH investments in the field of multiomics. Uh, Marie, the screen is yours. Thank you, Howard. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I would like to talk about the NIH's uh, current investment in multiomics research. In considering this topic, there are two key interrelated questions that we wanted to address. First, what are the significant investments by the NIH in multiomics research during the past five years? And second, what information do grant trends provide into what is needed to promote the NHGRI strategic vision? We started our analysis very simply. We queried the NIH iSearch grant database to see how many research program grants over the past five and a half years included the concept of multiomics in the title abstract or specific aim. And as you see on this graph showing the number of awarded grants per fiscal year, about 50 investigators raised the concept of multi-omics in their grants. The next year, this number doubled, and by 2020, the number showed an almost tenfold increase. This data is not surprising and shows the field is expanding, making it even more essential to understand the funding trends, so efforts are not duplicated and instead focus on research at the forefront. As Joan Ella discussed, there are many types of ohms and pairing or combinations in which they can be studied. Querying with a list of all possible combinations of ohms, for example, genome plus epigenome plus metabolome, or genome plus proteome plus metabolome, was uninformative as it identified over 52,000 grants. We therefore focused our search as follows. Inclusion criteria were NIH research program grants that either were awarded during or after 2016, and exclusion criteria were training grants and small business innovation research and small business technology transfer, SBIR, STTR grants. We identified four main queries that examined one, the types of ohms with clinical intent, two, types of clinical testing, three, longitudinal measures, and four, multi-omics. Using these targeted queries, the resulting list of about 450 grants was then read um, or the specific aims from 450 grants were then read and assessed by two uh, reviewers. I'd like to show you two slides that represent what we observed. This graph is a phone tree visualization. This tool groups grants into clusters based on key terms. The bigger the cluster, the more common the term. And this allows users to see at a glance the topic areas that are returned in their search. It also allows narrowing of results to focus on subcategories that are shown in gray within each cluster. The majority clusters for multi-omics, where first, technology, including single cell RNA sequencing and DNA methylation. Second, diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, HIV, breast cancer, and infectious disease. And third, other concepts such as big data um, and long-term monitoring. This is a phone tree based on the literature of multiomics. And while the literature lags behind the grant proposal, the clusters were similar with major themes of disease signatures and deep phenotyping, technology, data integration, and longitudinal omics. Consistent with the grant, 
and literature review. These topics are each represented in talks that will be presented today and tomorrow. While many institutes have funded some investigator initiated grants on multi-omics, we were most interested in the ICs that have made significant investments. And this list includes the ones that are listed on the right-hand side here. The NIA has funded integrated omics to understand healthy aging. NCI has the longstanding Cancer Genome Atlas and other programs such as uh, analysis of existing genomic sets plus omics and other factors. NIAID has omics for predictive modeling of infectious diseases. And NIM, NIMH has a brain initiative with eight different data collection modalities, including multi-omics, imaging, and cellular neurophysiology. NIDDK has a rich portfolio with a variety of programs, including the IPOP longitudinal multi-omics profiling of prediabetes. And NHLBI, which is represented in the pie chart here, has the Transomics for Precision Medicine TopMed program. TopMed has a foundation of about 200,000 whole genome sequences, which represent a cohort with diverse ancestry. TopMed 2.0 will continue to build and integrate other omics into this resource. And lastly, the Common Fund Hub Map, uh, which aims to develop a global platform to map healthy cells in the human body, uses the latest technology, including multi-omics. Several of these programs listed here are represented by investigator by investigators talked today. So in summary, as we dive into the workshop, we note that the majority of these are focused on specific diseases and conditions. We also know that the NHGRI portfolio um, includes approaches for data integration, SBIR, and investigator initiated grants. So a key, two key questions to focus on in the workshop are um, where can NHGRI have impact and where, what are the standards and generalizable approaches that are needed? And at this point, I'd like to hand it back to the moderator uh, for the discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marie. And uh, we are now uh, have a, we actually a little bit ahead of schedule. So we actually have about, um, 13 minutes for a Q&A session. And as a reminder, again, uh, if you have a question, please use the raise hand function. And also you can uh, turn on your video and, uh, um, and audio when you raise the question. So let me ask the first question, which is really to the NHGRI staff. And that is, uh, it's very heartening to see the increase in grant funding. I, these are likely uh, basically uh, uh, investigator initiated uh, in this area of multi-omics. And is that an acceptable kind of strategy? Just be like, let's wait and see how the field uh, sort of defines itself, right? And the best ideas will come in. What is the sort of unique uh, sort of, or what will be the, the, the strategy then to actually to, to, to do something anticipating or to direct uh, this area if there's already this existing interest? I'm happy to take the first pass at that, but others, I mean, you know, I, I think that's part of what we want to hear um, at a workshop like this. Uh, you know, what we've learned over the years um, with, with, you know, very nascent ideas is that there's, there's sort of the science that needs to be done. And then the, the, there's the style with which the science should be done. And by that, I mean, whether it's time for a big project, whether it's time for some small pilots, whether it's time to try to do this in a cooperative way by getting a collaborative network together, or whether it's just best to let you know a handful of flowers bloom through a, a series of investigator initiated awards. You know, I, I think going into a workshop like this, I don't think we have a strong um, bias as to which of those. I think it'd be heavily influenced by what we hear in terms of how mature certain areas are, whether it's really time to push the accelerator or whether it's time to just barely tap on a few different accelerators. So that's my take, but I would welcome my colleagues from NHGRI, any of them to weigh in, because again, this is all things we haven't even discussed yet, awaiting this workshop to happen first. I, I would just echo what Dr. Green said. I think we're waiting, this is the, the whole purpose of this workshop is to, to hear okay. from the community um, as to what steps we should, we should take. Okay, so Manoli Kellis, uh, great to see you first, and then Nancy Cox, uh, Manoli. Thank you so much, Howard. Great to see you as well. So I think my question is very similar, and it's uh, 
on one hand, there's the, I mean, basically it's beautiful to see these workshops come together and it's nice to sort of see this type of analysis of the grant. I'm curious if you could comment a little bit on the trend and whether this is going in the direction that you were expecting, whether there's some surprises in the trends or sort of how multiomics is increasing, decreasing. If there's specific areas that are lacking in, in sort of this field that, that you're envisioning, and uh, whether the only mechanism is through RFAs or if there's other types of encouragement that you can send to the community based on the vibes that you're feeling. So basically it's a general question about the, the trends that you see and whether you're happy with these trends, whether that you see sort of some areas of concern or something that you have not anticipated. I don't know who wants to take that. Marie, yeah. do you have any thoughts about that having done the portfolio analysis? Sure. Um, so I can't com comment on what the NHGRI's happiness level is, is on that, so I'll defer to Dr. Green on that. But what I will say is that the areas where there are gaps, um, this is, these are all represented in directly in the structure of the workshop. And it, this workshop was put together purposefully based on the trends and the gaps. So we're really hoping to be able to solicit community community input in these areas. And will it be clear through the workshop where the trends are and where the gaps are? <laughs> Ask us that. Um, <laughs> well, we, right. we, ho we hope so. Um, based, based, on the, based on what the speakers will be talking about, we've asked them to give uh, somewhat global, global talks on where they, where they feel the field is. Um, but obviously those are big talks too. <laughs> to ask any one person to, to account for. So we will be paying attention um, and certainly chiming in during the, the recommendation section. I think one thing we're looking forward, discussion. sorry, Marie, one thing we're looking to hearing from all of you is what Joe and Ella mentioned early, earlier, how, where, where are we at sort of the, the state of the science? How generalizable are the approaches? Uh, you know, we have a sense obviously that there's some, uh, standards that have been developed just to move some of these projects forward, but are those appropriate if you're looking across all diseases? Are they applicable to sort of uh, health in addition to disease? So kind of trying to figure out the, the sweet spot for NHGRI. What else do we need with data integration? Obviously, we're, we're seeing some new methods being developed. Uh, we're funding some of those, but are they extensive enough to really help us get to where we want to be? Yeah, I, I would say that while we're on this point, the portfolio analysis may be, be useful to do a comparison contrast. What's the biggest difference in the concepts between those uh, uh, grants funded by NHGRI versus other institutes? You might see, see something quite different. I might imagine that there's more technology development, tool development for NHGRI, and then the other institutes is more biology specific or disease specific per, uh, in, under the purview of their, their topic areas. Uh, when a technology is more mature, for example, that might be a possible sign that that's where NHGRI could have impact. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Nancy, do you have a question? Yeah, it was extremely interesting to see. So there's been much more investment in the development of biomarkers um, in the omic space than I think I would have appreciated before the presentation. And yet there's been much less um, direct movement of these kinds of biomarkers into medicine than, than we might've expected based on that investment and many of the positive results that we hear at meetings. And I know that there are barriers that relate to how to make omics technologies Put, put them into you know, clear space, that's a, that's a complicating factor. But I also suspect that the, the research level investigation of these things is still far from what we need to get it into clinical practice. And I wonder um, whether somebody could speak to some of those barriers. I mean, I'm certainly gonna bring that up in my talk uh, to some degree, but, but I think as Judy Cho has sometimes said, we have ha had hardly any new biomarkers in 40 years of, of medicine, um, sort of in, in my professional lifetime, a few, a few that are widely used, but very few uh, new biomarkers over that time. And these are such rich 
um, opportunities for biomarker development that I think we could be doing so much better in medicine with some of these kinds of biomarkers that we know provide really rich signals for disease progression, disease onset. So, so it, it, we already know that they, they should be working, but somehow they're not getting into enough of the clinical. So I'd love to hear more discussion from your perspective on why that hasn't happened and, and what you think needs to be done to get this at scale into medicine. I mean, I don't know who wants to take that. Darren, you want to take that? I mean, I, Nancy, I think the issues you raise are exactly what we hope to get out of this workshop. I mean, so, you know, I would point out that the notice the wording in the strategic vision. You know, we didn't just say we're interested in multi omic stuff. We said multi -omic, sort of health applications. We really leaned in, leaned in for the very reason that you're saying is why is it, you know, and, and as somebody who's trained as a clinical pathologist, you know, when you think about what we're, we assay for a clinic, it really hasn't advanced much since I was trained or when, since I was uh, in medical school. And you wonder why, with so much more data available, you know, there, there, I, I do agree with you. I feel like there's something missing. And so that's why, you know, it is one of the reasons why we sort of leaned in on this to try to see if there's new multiomic approaches that could give us new clinically relevant biomarkers. Yeah, not, not only the approaches, but what sort of translational research do we need to do to take that initial knowledge that's generated um, and, you know, think about the implementation science to get that knowledge into the clinic. And that's something we're starting to do a bit more uh, in our division of genomic medicine, but, but clearly there's a heck of a lot more that we need to, to do there. And I, I would just add that that is ex exactly the point of what's at the forefront, right? So we can think about whether to go down the path of just doing more and more research or whether we can go down the path of, of trying to do more clinical implementation. And so it's asking, that is the question we're trying to ask, which way should we go? And we would love to hear from the community, is it time now? Are we ready for that? Or, or is there something else that needs to happen? Okay, uh, David Craig, you have your yeah. hand. Yes, um, so in your analysis, how do you, how is it, were you able to really take into account public-private partnerships? And I ask, thinking to myself, some of the biggest things I think of, like Answer ALS, AMP PD, they're places where really the agency is helping facilitate with a private partner. And so do you, is that perhaps being underestimated where, and in fact, there is a bigger resource? Because sometimes I see these private partnerships facilitated by the public sector are really leading. I would um, say, um, Marie, be... you can, sorry, I was gonna point to you, Marie, but I, I would say my first guess is yes, that likely is uh, underestimated. And also not only the public-private partnerships, but other, you know, the work that's just being done in the, in the private industry as well, that's not captured in our analysis either. Yeah, it might depend on, I mean, what David mentioned as examples, some of those are executed through the foundation for NIH, and I'm not sure that data would have been captured by the databases that Marie was looking at. So I think it probably is an underestimate. I, I definitely, I was focused on the, on the, um, the institutes in, in my searches, so it would not be included. Yeah, so I, I definitely agree with uh, uh, David's point. I think this is definitely an opportunity. I think a lot of exciting, actually, including biomarkers and actually multi-omic technologies are, are being implemented actually in the uh, uh, in in the, uh, through our uh, through companies. Um, okay, uh, any other comments or questions? I'm looking at my chat here. Okay, well, seeing no further comments at this point, uh, let me turn then this session over uh, to Judy, uh, who introduced uh, our first session, uh, setting the stage for multi-omic studies.